Um, we have Ms. Herman. Can the rest of the folks from Allen please introduce yourself for the record? I'm Deputy Warden Brent Thompson. Assistant Warden Jesse Bellamy. Assistant Warden Crystal Simon. All right, great. Thank you all. Thanks for accommodating us today. And we have one case at your facility this morning. And sir, Mr. King, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number. Um, uh, Douglas Hume, DOC 535184. All right, yes, sir. You're here this morning, Mr. Hume. Let me introduce the pardon board to you. My name is Cheryl Renazza. I'm serving as chairman today. Seated to my far left is Mrs. Jackson, my immediate left. Mr. Roche, my immediate right is Mr. Carabella, and to his right is Mr. Freeman. Mr. Hume, I'm going to read some identifying information into the record. I ask you to verify that information, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Marabella. Your case has been assigned to him this morning. He'll take the lead on an interview. We'll hear from the folks there at Allen. Uh, and if anybody, uh, we do have some folks that were joining us by Zoom if they're um on at the appropriate time, we can't get in touch with them. We'll hear from them. At the very end, you'll be allowed to make a statement before we go. All right, sir, you ready to proceed? Yes, I am. All right, Mr. Douglas Hume, DOC numbers 535184. You're seeking commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in Livingston Parish, February 2008, to 25 years for a conviction for oral sexual battery. You do have a full term date, which is in 2031. Mr. Hume, is that information correct? Yes, ma'am, it is. Arabella? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Hume, my name is Tony Marabella. Uh, your case was assigned to me, so I'll begin the interview process. Mr. Mr. Hume, how old are you today? I am 49 years old. And how long have you been in prison on these charges? Just over 16 years. Tell me a little bit about your education. Let, let's talk about who you were back then. Uh, how far had you gone in school back uh, when you came to prison? Uh, before I was in prison, sir, I received a bachelor's of arts degree from South Dakota State University in Spanish education. And who were you living with? At the time, I was living alone. I was li living alone. Were you ever involved in drugs or alcohol? No, sir. Have you ever had any, prior to coming to prison, have you ever had any mental health issues? No, sir. Uh, any kind of medication that you were taking at the time? I was taking uh, prescription Prozac at the time for clinical depression. And how long had you been taking Prozac? I guess about two, three years. Something like that. Let's talk about some of the things that you've done while you've been in prison. Now, you've gotten uh, more educational certificates. Is that correct? Tell me about those. Yes, sir. Um, while I was in uh, the faith-based training community, I received both an associate's and a bachelor's degree from Cornerstone University in religious education, basically a seminary degree to teach uh, the Word of God. Uh, you've, you've done a lot of educational work, as I've seen, and you've taken a couple of programs. Uh, you took uh, the four phases of sex offender treatment? Yes, sir. What other programs did you take? Um, as I said, I have taken the faith-based training community, and I believe you have, I have a lot of certificates from that. We had a lot of... I, I, I do understand that. I'm, I'm talking about other programs like Cage Your Rage. I think you took that. Did yes, you take sir. any other programs along the lines of any sort of victim awareness or anything like that? Um, just through faith-based. Just all the ones through faith-based. A lot of like, uh, trust and tragedy. Now, tell me what you learned in the sex offender treatment program that would give me some insight as to who you are today. Okay, I learned that I was extremely selfish and I put my own desires above hers, and which included good common sense. Um, I learned just how people could perceive me, how I was perceiving others, and how to better myself so that I don't put myself in a position again or put somebody else and cause that much pain and suffering to somebody else. 
That is not who I am today. I am the total opposite of who I was when I did when I did this crime. <clears throat> Tell me what prompted you to do the crime back then. What have you been able to inwardly understand why you committed this crime? Plain selfishness, sir. It was, I was put myself, put my feelings above everybody. Well, talk to me about your feelings. What are your feelings? I mean, it's unnatural for, for someone to want to molest young children. It so is. tell me what you're, you say you were selfish. Being selfish is one thing, but what, what, were, what have you learned about yourself that will convince me that you might not do something like this again. Because I've learned that it is, it's not the right way to approach somebody. It is not the right way to earn somebody's trust in order to live within a society where law, it, where there is decent law and order. Um, well, I, I, I understand that. That's good book learning. I mean, I think we all know in civics, you shouldn't violate the law. Yes, sir. My question to you is, you obviously had some emotional, personal issues yes, that sir, caused to what you did. Yes, sir, and I've did. got reason to believe this was not the first time that something like that happened. So my question to you is, what have you done looking inward to prevent that from the future? I mean, you tell me you're selfish, well, okay, but, but you know, how can I be comfortable saying, I'm going to let this man out again, and this may very well happen again? Because I took responsibility for everything that I've done. I accept that. I, uh, when, when I was arrested, I voluntarily gave a full confession. I knew at the time I needed to change. I needed to change. And I spent the last 16 years rebuilding myself and my life in order to become a more productive citizen and not let this happen again. Let me ask you this. What do you think this young girl feels today? Uh, shame. I think she feels shame. I think she feels tremendous sadness. I think she feels anger. I know I feel feel angry to Morris myself for, for allowing things to go this way. Tell me how this even came about. Tell me what, what happened. Basically, we were sitting around and things led to me putting my mouth on her vagina. This little girl had special needs. I mean, she she had some very serious issues yes, medically and emotionally she did and i took advantage of that <laughs> i took advantage of a special needs girl very very special in not just special needs but she was a very precious little girl and i took advantage of that i accept that i accept the fact that i really screwed up i accept the fact that i caused harm to her her family and my family, and a lot of me is just to myself. I spent the last 16 years in prison when I should be, the way I was hoping to go with the Harveys was I was hoping that this was it, this was going to be my family. And I messed that up. I accept that. When did you first start having feelings towards young children? Sexual feelings towards young children? I get, I really hadn't until, until that time. I don't know how to describe that to you. It, it just, one thing led to another. And next thing I knew I was doing something I can't believe I actually did. I, you did this more than once, didn't you? No, sir, I did not. You didn't? No, sir. This is the Please only- do the occasions that you did, maybe you didn't do everything you did the last time. You're telling me this was only on one occasion? Yes, sir.
So what would be your plan to tell me what is it that you learned in your sex offender program that is going to help you not have these feelings? First of all, you just have to be aware of them. You have to be aware of them and you have to replace those with other thoughts that will not allow you to go down a road like I did like I did here. Since you've been in prison, have you had any mental health evaluation of any sort? Just your basic ones that they that they do that they do occasionally. I and you have not been diagnosed with anything? Are you taking any no, medication sir. now? No, sir. The charge originally was, I mean, I, I, I hear you, Mr. Hugh, and I, I, you know, if I could count, I, I probably will count a thousand times you've said me or I, what you've done for you. Uh, you know, what you did was horrible. You were charged with aggravated rape. You say, oh, I took responsibility for it. They reduced those charges so you could get a deal. I mean, I, I don't I don't find your acceptance of responsibility convincing me you'll never do this again. I'm very concerned about that. Uh, what do you what do you say to that? I would say, sir, that I understand. I accept what you what you what you believe from this. But what I have learned in prison, I can't, I, it's hard for me to convince you, for you to know what I've done the last 16 years. I, I, I understand that, I accept that, because I don't know you at all. First okay. time I've paid eyes on you, read your file a week ago. But your family knows you, and they all oppose your getting out because they're afraid you're going to do this again. Why would they feel that way? I don't know, sir. I don't have, I don't know. I, I pretty much have lost contact with my family. I contact with, I'm, I have been in contact with my mother very, very rarely. No, nobody else, I have not talked to any other member of my family in 16 well, years. Where forever, if you were to get out early? I'm sorry? Where would you live if you were able to get out early? I have friends and family in Texas who are waiting for me, sir. Who is that? Uh, I have a distant cousin by the name of Shirlene Weller, who I, I discovered, who I discovered, and I would be, I have uh, two businesses that I actually have the business plans for right here that I would be doing, I would be doing, I have angel investors ready to go. You know, Mr. Jim, I'm, I'm going to say it again, and then I'm going to let my colleagues and I'll listen to what anyone else has to say. All I'm hearing is you, 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 you. Work, faith-based. Uh, I, I, I don't see you dealing with the issue that I see that you have. So uh, I'm going to, uh, that's all the questions I have. Warden, what can you tell us about Mr. Uh, Hume? Uh, yes, sir. Only thing I have to say, really and truly, is that uh, obviously we have to see his disciplinary record is pretty exceptional. Uh, but um, he and I spoke on last week, and my main concern is that uh, whether he uh, continue being incarcerated or in the civilian world, he's going to need extensive help. And that's my opinion. Thank you, Warren. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Yeah, this is Jackson. His questions. Good morning, Mr. Hume. My name is Bonnie Jackson. I've reviewed your record, and when I do want to talk about something, don't mean to get into something that might be too difficult for you to talk about. <clears throat> but uh, at one point in your life, you attempted suicide. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I did. And uh, the information that I have from reviewing the records suggests that uh, 
you intimate it to your family, I don't know, your mother, that the suicide attempt was because of similar issues involving um, sexual interest in children. Uh, suicide was not about that, ma'am. Suicide was not about that. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what was going on that caused you to think suicide was? I had uh, felt isolated. I felt alone. I had so much coming against me that I didn't see a way out. What was coming against you? I how old were you? Um, I was 22, 23. So what was coming against you at age 22 or 23? It just, it felt like I did not have anybody, anybody who cared. It's just the way I felt at the time. I didn't feel like I had anybody who cared. I didn't have anybody who who loved me and wanted and wanted and wanted to help. Obviously, I was wrong, but that's just the way I felt. If 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 there was a, a feeling among your family members that you had always had an interest in younger children to the extent that it made them feel uncomfortable. How would you respond to that? It was never brought up to me, ma'am. It's hard for me to answer that question because I, it was never presented to me. Well, even even if they never said it, um, the question is, have you, from an early age, earlier than when this offense occurred, been attracted to children um, sexually? Uh, I haven't. Like I said, like I told, said before, I have not. This was something that went too far. And I made a terrible mistake. But see, you, you kind of want to yada, yada, yada over it. I mean, going too far. I mean, why did it even start to begin with? Get to the point of being too far. There had to be some. And when you say that you, when you talked about your feelings surrounding the time you attempted suicide, sometimes people feel more comfortable with children than they do with adults because they feel rejection by adults and children are, are you know, less, less threatening if you would. Uh, I'm just listening to you, Mr. Hume, and, and I heard what the warden said, and it does seem like there are a lot of issues that you just haven't dealt with. You try to cover them up by you know, taking, you know, being involved in programs and, and doing things in and around the prison. But I, I worry that you haven't really recognized the depth of, of your, your problem. And you're a young man and I'm uncomfortable with where you are right now, thinking that you're not going to find yourself in this situation again, because I don't think that you have really dealt with what is it in you that caused you to have this uh, proclivity towards young children. I just think there's a lot there that you need to work on because you have a Really done the painful work that it's going to take mm -hmm. to, to make sure that this is behind you. Uh, but, uh, thank you. I appreciate your, your talking to me. Right. We have some folks who are, who are here with us in Baton Rouge that uh, want to speak. Um, Ms. Angela Harvey. 
And the only way we could get aggravated rape was to give him a life sentence. And I had to put my daughter on the stand in order to do that. And I, as her mother, could not do that to her. But I got a life sentence. And I've served every day that he has served inside the walls. And I will serve every day beyond his 25 years. He took and tore my family apart. And I can tell you why he has no contact with his family. Because I talked to his mother after he was arrested. His mother and his aunt were molested as children. And they live with the same thing I'm living with every day. And they could not believe what their son had done and the nightmares that they still live with. So that's why they isolated from him. And then they started talking to members of their family. And all of a sudden, naps came up with his nieces and stuff that he wanted to go lay down with. So his whole family here turned against him because of that. So Brittany was not his first victim. Brittany was the first one that was caught. And I knew after the first time he was with her, but I could not get my daughter to admit it. Brittany, you have to ask her very specific. He will do this again if he gets out and another mother will be in my shoes serving a life sentence because he will not stop. He is sick. I live with this every day as well as my child, but I have protected her as much as I can. And I don't let her know what all goes on. She doesn't even know about today because she still has nightmares over it. Please don't let him out. Another mother should not have to go through what I am. Thank you. Miss Norma, did you want to speak? Thank you. Barbie's grandmother. She's my first born grandchild. She has with her son, another child, as loving, sweet, and giving as his child is. And her mom found out that she was dying. For the police, she starts crying, please don't do anything to this dog. Please don't hurt him. That's the type of child she is. We went through counseling. She had to go through a rape kit. To this day, they cannot do a female exam on that child because she goes into hysterics. He has scarred my grandchild a lot. He agreed. And like we said, the only reason he's not in prison for life is because we could not put her on the stand. Counselors advised us against her going on the stand. And so we agreed to 25 years without one day off. For good behavior. The district attorney told me in this type of case, they do not get any time off, sir, for good behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we lost the board, man. How's it happen? <laughs> Look at that cockroach. I'm, I'm gonna need to take a shower after this one. This is sick. What's up with this facial hair? You gotta be kidding me. Can you guys believe what we just saw? It's gonna come back online. We'll chat about it until it does. Looks like the 
There's a close up of the cockroach. What a sick, sick, sick. We want to look at evil. We're looking at evil. This is scary stuff. Can you imagine what he said when they brought up it was a special needs child? She says, yes, she was a very special little girl. Monsters do exist. And we're looking at it. And you know what's the sickest part? Is that he's going to get out in nine years. All right. I, All right. I apologize I'll, for the, the inconvenience. We had a computer reboot. Um, Mr. Hume, is there a statement you'd like to make to the board before we vote? At this point, ma'am, I think I pretty much know how this is going to go. Uh, all I can say is I can't tell you how sorry I am. They have every right to feel the way they do. And they have every you have every responsibility to keep me incarcerated at this point, I think. I can already tell that's pretty much the way this is going to go. But I can't tell you, and it's hard to, to really describe exactly the remorse I feel from the camera. I, uh, I'm so sorry to the Hardy family. I'm so sorry to mine for taking things out of context that weren't meant, meant for it. If that is the way they feel, that is the way they feel. I cannot change it. So at this point, I just leave the decision to you. Well, we're ready to vote. Mr. Marabella will be voting first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Hume, uh, you've done well while you've been in prison. You've worked hard. You've got structure. Your, uh, your disciplinary record is good. Uh, you've taken a lot of education courses. Uh, but there are a lot of things that you haven't done. And those are looking inward as to who you are and why you are. And uh, I think the warden said it. You're going to need a, 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 a lot of help. Uh, and you're in a place right now where you can get it. I, I think that you need to take some programs that you can begin to look inwardly and make a determination as to what it is inside you that caused you to do these things. And until you get to that point, I don't think you're ever going to appreciate and realize what you've done and who you are. Based upon the offense itself, the, the, the comments from the warden, uh, the opposition, both law enforcement as well as, as the victims, as well as your own family. Uh, my vote today would be to deny your request for a pardon. Madam Chairman, Mr. Mr. Freeman. Um, I concur with Mr. Marabella. You are doing good things in that. Hope you continue to help others get their eyes set, but you're definitely not ready for release. And my vote is to deny. Mr. Jackson. Um, Mr. Hume, um, you know, I do have concerns because I don't think you really come to terms with what is what is it in you that you need to get fixed so that you're not a, a risk to other people. Uh, I'll just encourage you to do some more introspection, maybe taking victim awareness, but really you've got to look at yourself and figure out, you know, what, you know, what, what has happened to you in your life that's caused you to be at this place. Sounds like there's a lot of hurt and trauma in your life that you need to deal with. 
but I don't think you're ready. I'm going to encourage you to keep trying to get to the root of why you uh, did what you did. But my vote today is to deny the, the victim opposition and continuing harm to the victim. And I just think we need some more work. A good luck to you, Mr. Hughes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. New, good morning. Good morning. Based upon overwhelming opposition from the DA's office, who prosecuted this case, adamant opposition from the victim's family, opposition from your family, and I think that you are a potential risk your family and the general public, our vote is to deny your request. All right, Mr. Hume, uh, I do concur with my colleagues. I think we have some more work to do. You do have an outdate, um, but you got a lot of work to do in the meantime. My vote today is to deny your application. I wish you well. Good luck, sir. Thank you. And what are we going to do when That's he does get out? Mr. Allen, thanks for accommodating. We are going to recess at 9.46. Thank you all. 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 What are you going to do when he gets out, huh? What are we going to do? That thing, that cockroach, that monster, that is going to get out in nine years. Let's give a big pat on the back to his family for not supporting him. It is nice and refreshing to see that. His... The amount of damage and chaos that thing has created in this world, we only saw the tip of the iceberg. It just kept getting worse and worse. She was a special needs girl. And his answer, yes, she was a very special little girl. I don't know how he ended up alone with a special needs girl, but I'm not going to talk. Her mother is dealing with enough. It's not the right thing. We were sitting around and things led to me putting my mouth. That's what he said. Then he says, things went too far. Of course, I don't need to get into how much he lied the entire time. What we just watched is a sick creature that cannot be fixed. Ms. Jackson says, we need, you know, to find a way to fix, you can't be fixed. I could think of a few ways, actually. It would involve a large blade. What's up with that? The prosecutor saying he's going to get 25 years and no good time, and then this happens. Is, is this because of the new laws that allow for it? I don't know why they give child predators that's cold, that's cold. any type of... Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, look in... Look in, 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 in. Any type of access to this. It's disgusting. I do love that his family opposed it. Then he goes on to say, oh, I have a cousin that wants to see me. Of course, another lie. 
Then he goes, oh, it's a, a distant cousin. I discovered her. <laughs> he brings to his parole hearings business plans. Who brings business plans? I have angel investors ready to go, meaning people who want to invest in his brilliant entrepreneurial business plan. This is, uh, you know, it's so important that we see these things because this thing is going to get out one day. And what do you think this thing is going to do? It's a rhetorical question. We all know the answer. And I know they have registries for this thing, but how many people look into registries? There needs to be better ways of, for when this thing gets out, you're literally like, that's the crazy thing. And I get, I get, you know, they were going to say a life sentence. You know what's sad is that he could have gotten a life sentence and probably still have had this hearing. And that's a flaw in this new law. The law is really great. It's for people who got a life sentence for, you know, possession one or whatever. But this thing should not be getting any chances. So what, what do you do? What do you do when it gets out in 2031? There needs to be something maybe better than the registry. There needs to be, you know, a great business idea maybe we can get angel investors for. is some type of registry that follows these people. And then when they move somewhere, everyone in the neighborhood within 20 miles gets a letter. That would be a good non-for-profit. A letter with its picture on it with its address. Every potential employer should get this letter. We can have a text message go out, an email, whatever. That would be a good way to protect our children. We're literally watching a ticking time bomb. Where's the prison justice when you need it? I keep hearing in the comment section that prison justice is a Hollywood thing. It doesn't really exist. Someone said, Cockroach is too kind of a word that they're a termite in the comment section because termites destroy the foundation of a home the same way that they can destroy the foundation of our society. They're destroying lives. It's a ripple effect that lasts generations. Couldn't even kill himself successfully. A waste of air. I'm proud of his family for disowning this thing. Cockroach. even on his last speech, if this is the way they feel, that's what he says about their family. If this is the way they feel, that that is the way they feel.
He was preying on his own family. I'm done with this thing. But we do need a better way to keep track of these things when they get, get out. This is something that we need to do better. With that, I'll let you go.